we uh, are happy to introduce John Engler from the English department. And uh, he's a repeat presenter. He was here last year presenting, did a great job. So we're really excited to have him back. Um, I'll give you a bit of a bio here for John. Uh, John has been teaching writing and literature at Utah State University for 13 years. He has degrees from BYU, which is a bachelor's in, in English literature, USU, uh, which is a master's in American studies, and Pacific Lutheran University with an MFA in nonfiction writing. So uh, the author, he's the author of published essays, stories, and articles, and now 23 annual Valentine's poems to his wife. Uh, so he, um, John has taught more than 120 classes at USU and has read more than 75,000 pages of student papers. So, so there's a man who knows about dangling modifiers and... <laughs> All right. So meanwhile, his students have contributed some 5,000 hours of community service to Valley organizations via service learning projects. So without further ado, we'll turn the time over to John. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. It's good to be with you guys. Uh, I'm impressed we're staying to the end of the day. That's, uh, that's always a thing, right, at, at a conference. The, the subject of today really is the syllabus. Uh, I love to write a good syllabus. I don't, I don't know about you guys. Maybe that's because I'm a writer. But I love to write a good syllabus because I imagine how this is going to play out with students over the course of the year. Uh, I like to get the wording just right, the assignments just right. And in fact, my syllabi, sometimes I think they're so great. I wish I could publish them and get some publishing credit towards tenure and promotion. Do you ever feel that way? You're just like, this is a great syllabus. And yet, I'm standing here and talking about teaching with no syllabus, right? We, uh, we put so much into our syllabi, right? We, we, we dump everything in there because we, we want students to have every bit of information, uh, the schedule and the assignment descriptions and all the policies and rules and grading procedures. And we put it all in there. And we hope that students are going to read that because we give it to them. And sometimes, sometimes, they do read it, right? But have you ever felt like this, <laughs> right? All the time we get questions, the answer to which is in the syllabus. Uh, and so this becomes a thing. But you don't actually even have to go make your own t-shirt. You can go to Zazzle.com and, and buy them for $17.95. You can even get a mug. And I found out that you can actually buy a onesie within the syllabus. You can start, off, start them young. It's, 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 a, it's a cultural thing. It's become a cultural thing. It's even become an internet meme the whole in, it's in the syllabus thing. It's a cultural icon, the syllabus. From the time my children are in junior high, they have a syllabus for every single class. And so we're talking about no syllabus today. How does that work? What does that even mean when we talk about no syllabus? Uh, when we start thinking about why would we not have a syllabus, for me, it, uh, it, it's, a, it's a long history of trying to write my syllabus so well that it can't fail to produce great results from my students. And then each year, that syllabus, that perfect, perfect document, in some way comes up short. And my students don't quite achieve what I hope they're going to achieve. And I take on that responsibility, and I think, it must be the syllabus. I've got to write a better syllabus. And I go back. And it took me a number of years to realize, maybe it's not just that. Maybe there's something else going on here. Uh, and really, it comes down to, for me, one principle. And it's, it's a three-part principle. Whoever writes the syllabus has ownership. Whoever has ownership cares. And whoever cares does the work. And so when I talk about doing the work, I don't just mean doing the assignments. I, do the, I mean the work of learning right? that we want our students to do, the really engaged, meaningful learning. When I talk about caring, I don't just mean caring about a grade, because so many of our students do really care about their grades, don't they? But what I mean is caring about the learning, caring about themselves enough 
to invest in the learning. So when we talk about ownership of the syllabus, what, what am I actually talking about? When I say no syllabus, what do I mean? Here's some of the things that typically go into a syllabus, right? We, we just pile it all in there. What, what, what of these things did I not give them? Well, I didn't give them any assignments. I didn't give them any exams. In fact, none of these things were in the syllabus. Now, that's not to say there wasn't an actual document, because by university policy, we do have to give them a syllabus. And so there was technically a document, but it didn't have any of these things in it that we typically put into a syllabus. What I got to the point of saying is, I need to strip out everything I can possibly strip out. It will probably be too much to strip out, but in order for me to figure out what they actually do need, I have to strip it all out first, and then figure out what I need to put back. So I spent a year, taught eight different classes over the course of the year, stripped everything out, except for these four things which I needed to give them. One, the course outcomes is kind of stipulated by the department slash university, right? We have to have those in there. They need to know what is this course for. They have to come and understand what is the content covered here. What are the textbooks that I've ordered? The university, in fact, the state legislature mandates that we order textbooks for the class well ahead of time, so I had to have textbooks ordered. Uh, then we talk about the workload expectations. We know the amount of work, right? If I'm not giving them assignments, how much work do I expect out of them? Well, the university kind of has set a standard for that. For every hour in class, it's one to two to three hours outside of class, depending on the level of the course, right? We teach them this from the day they walk in as freshmen. And finally, they have to have a final grade. That's the one grade that is required by the university. No other grades are necessarily required by the university, just that one final grade. This was everything stripped out. And so this is as much as they, they were given for the course. And then I gave them this and we said, now what's your plan? What's your plan? And each one of them said, okay, here's my plan for reaching these course outcomes. Here's how I'm gonna put in my time and the workload I'm gonna do, and to get the work done. And they each wrote, essentially, their own syllabus, each student in the course. And then we proceeded from there. Now, we can talk about, if you want to, uh, we can talk about what that course looked like and how that went. What I wanted to kind of focus on today were five things that surprised me, that I wasn't expecting to realize as we went through this process. And if, if there's still questions on the logistics of how this works out later, maybe we can address those. But let's, let's just hit on these five things. The first thing is, I, I never knew how much power a syllabus gives to a teacher. I mean, I knew there was power there, right? You're, you're, you're running the show, you're in charge. But I never knew how much power it was until we took that away. And I, in a sense, became very powerless in the classroom. And I was glad to become powerless. Because when I become powerless, then the power resides with the students. And then they have the power to make decisions about their education. And when they have that ownership, they care and they do the work. In some ways, I, I'm really glad that I was able to do this because if I hadn't realized how much power was in that syllabus, and I was still using a syllabus in the traditional way, I've come to realize that it's almost, it borders a little bit for me on an ethical question. Is it right for one adult to have that much power over another adult in a free society? Yes, I know they signed up for the class and they have volunteered essentially to do this work. In fact, they've paid to do this work but it started to look a little bit like indentured servitude to me. I was telling them what to do, when to do it, how much to do it, where to do it, when to do it, and if they didn't do it how I thought, there was this grade, this guillotine of a grade hanging over them. And I have a, I have a little bit of a problem with the ethics of a, of a power situation like that. And so I'm really glad that I found out how much power I had been kind of exercising over students all these years when I pulled this away and the power went back to them. It makes a big difference in a classroom 
when the power dynamics change, when the students not only own the syllabus, but they own the classroom, and they own the class time, and they're the ones making the decisions in the room. It changes things. The second thing, I never knew how much a syllabus shields students from actual responsibility. Have you ever felt this, that the students are just kind of, they, it's almost like a lose track. They start in on the course and they just get in there and they just follow it wherever it goes. And they're not making many decisions other than, am I going to do the work or not? But they're not actually making very many decisions that require them to critically think about their own education that ask them to examine what am I doing and why am I doing it or how can I do it better. And so I found that a syllabus really protects them in a way and shields them from that responsibility. Uh, and really, if I, if I come right down to it, what, I'm trying to, what, I, what I think I'm trying to do is help prepare these students for a future, a future uh, of being an educated individual and in fact, if everything I'm doing in the course is shielding them from the responsibility I one day hope, them, hope that they will accept, I may actually be doing them a disservice by writing them a syllabus instead of asking them to do it. The third thing. I never knew how much a, a syllabus compresses student performance. I always knew that a syllabus was never really hitting the prime target for all of my students, right? I knew that the syllabus was kind of a middle ground type of thing, that there were some students who had more ability than the syllabus was asking them to do. I knew that there were some students who had less ability than the syllabus was requiring of them, right? Uh, and so on the front end, I always knew that a syllabus missed a little bit, but I never realized how much on the back end a syllabus altered the range of performance until there was no syllabus. Because a syllabus, props up the students who aren't quite ready, right? Because it gives them all the answers. It takes away that responsibility and gives, all you have to do is do this, 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 and this. And it tells them everything to do. And it props them up in a way where that because they don't have that responsibility, that maybe they don't have the skill set or they're not ready, but it props them up. And maybe that's an okay thing. Maybe it's not quite right. The, maybe even the bigger issue is that it really holds back and throttles the students who have more ability and more skill than the syllabus asks of them. When I took away the syllabus, that range of performance really spread. And there were some students who didn't do as well as they might have had I spoon-fed them the whole way. But there were some students who really excelled and did maybe even double the amount of work that they would have done had I given them a syllabus with a list of assignments. And not because they thought they had to do that work, but because they wanted to, and because they were able to, and because they had ownership of it, and said, this matters to me. I'm going to do something with my education. I'm going to make the most of my time and my money and my experience. And so I realized that when I remove that syllabus, that range of performance is a is much, much greater range. The fourth thing. I never realized how much a syllabus bridles what happens in the classroom. Because I have designed the course, I have designed the series of assignments or exams or discussions. I know what's going to happen. I've got it all planned out in my head. I've got my lecture notes ready to go, my discussions prepared, my class exercises and activities all planned out. It's going to be what I've planned it to be. And I've been doing this a long time. And I figure I've got a pretty good idea how to do that efficiently and to do it well. But it also means that it's only going to be that. When I pulled out the syllabus and I said to the students, the class time is yours. How are you going to use this time to further your education towards these course outcomes? All kinds of crazy things started happening in the room. Things that I didn't have control over because they had ownership. Some really cool things happened things that I would have never planned, I would have never expected, I would never have planned for. And it was a lot scarier for me, right? Because I don't know exactly what's going to happen because I'm not in charge. 
but it was also a lot more thrilling for me, which kind of goes to my fourth point, is that I never knew how much a syllabus dampens the joy of teaching, just pulls it out, because it's regimented, and it's planned, and it's known, especially since uh, the, the course I teach the most is English 2010. I've probably taught we have nearly 100 sections of English 2010 over the last dozen years. I know exactly when it's my syllabus. I know how that's going to go. I know how these lessons are going to go. I know when I put out a question to the room, even though it's an open-ended question, they can say whatever they want. I know exactly what they're going to say because they've said it dozens of times already. The thrill of teaching is gone in those kinds of situations. It took it away. But here's something that changed. When the students had control of the room and they said, John, would you come next week and teach us, spend about 15 minutes, and would you teach us about the Tolman model next week for about 15 minutes? We, we really need some help understanding this. And I walked into the classroom that day. It changed everything. Because now instead of me walking into the room knowing I was dragging them through this lecture that they really didn't want to have, that I wasn't even sure if they cared about this thing or not, now I knew that they cared, they wanted it, they needed it, they were ready for it, and they had invited me. I was now their guest in the room, and it changed the entire dynamic of the classroom. It, it brings a whole different feel to teaching. When a student, you know, um, it, it, under the kind of the old way of doing things, I would know on a syllabus what assignments were coming. And so I would teach ahead of the assignment, right? I would prepare them for what was coming. Here's what's coming. I'm going to prepare you with the skills that I think you're going to need in order to succeed on this assignment. The problem was that they didn't know how much they were going to need what I was teaching them because they hadn't tried it yet. They hadn't realized the need for what I was giving them. And so they didn't really get it. Without a syllabus, what would happen is they would go in and they would try something. They would realize, hey, this is harder than we thought it was going to be. We're running into some roadblocks here. Maybe John can help us. And they would come to me for help, and they would ask very specific questions. How do I do this thing? And I realized that that's the moment when students were ready to learn, when they had a need and they came to me for help. Now they're ready to listen because they've asked a question. So rather than teaching the front end, and now I'm teaching on the back end of their experience. And it really changed, I think, their experience, and it certainly changed my experience because now I felt valued in the room because they had a question. And as they were talking, as they were listening, I could see that they were listening, that they were learning, that they were taking that in and using it. Five things that kind of surprised me when I pulled out the syllabus. Now. What's next? I'm going to put some things back in. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, in fact, earlier today, I, I, I was in a session on the faded scaffolding. And I hadn't heard that term before, but I realized that what I've planned for my fall class is that. One of the challenges, in fact, the biggest challenges my students have faced is shifting into this mode of learning. They've never done this before, and the hardest thing is for them to take that responsibility, to design their learning, and to follow through on what their plans were. And I tell them, after, after I'd done this once, I realized that was going to be the hardest thing. And every, semester, every class since then, I said, this is going to be the hardest thing. And still, it was the hardest thing. Even though they knew it was going to be the hardest thing, it was still the hardest for them to actually take that full ownership. And so this is one thing I'm going to do. Is I'm going to start to scaffold a little bit more at the beginning of the course and prop them up a little bit and then slowly fade away that scaffold and take one piece away at a time until three or four weeks into the semester. Now we're ready for you to take full ownership and we'll shift the responsibility fully to them at that point. So that's one of the things that we're going to do. One of the other things that we're going to do is I'm really going to ask if they will be willing to spend half of class time uh, in one-on-one -on -one consultations with me. Uh, the rest of the class, while I'm in one-on-one -on -one consultations with various students, the rest of the class will be working on their projects, and we can talk about kind of how that class is set up if, if that's interesting to you. But 
Uh, they will have other things to be doing the rest of class. But it's really important, I'm finding, to take that one-on-one -on -one time with students and give them the chance to ask those questions to have that one-on-one -on -one teaching time, which is exactly what we heard about uh, this morning in the, in the keynote, is that one-on-one -on -one attention for students. And so we're going to try to shift, keep shifting the classroom from me in the front, lecturing, talking, leading a discussion, to students owning the room. And I'll be on the side of the room with one other student kind of as their consultant. Um, I want them to understand that I am at their disposal, not them at mine. Right? This is their education. And so as, as we kind of proceed on their projects, I want them to uh, kind of answer to the university rather than answering to me. Here's what the university is expecting. Here's the course outcomes. Here's the amount of work the university expects. You answer to them. I am not the, the policeman of the classroom. I am your advocate in your challenge to meet the university expectations. So it changes the relationship with my students in a way that I think is really useful and beneficial. Five things I never knew until I taught without a syllabus. Thank you. I'd be glad to take any questions if you have any. Yeah, Alan. Yeah, and so the, the question, in case you didn't hear it, was with different students doing different projects, how do, how do we develop a, a consistent assessment? Uh, and, and that's absolutely a challenge. There's no question about that. That's absolutely a challenge. Uh, I haven't, well, here, here's, here's what we're planning for the fall. Let me tell you what I'm planning for the fall, is that as part of their syllabus, they will each design whatever projects they want. If they want lar a smaller number of large projects or a larger number of small projects, that's fine. But for each project, they also develop a rubric for that project. And that as we kind of finalize that syllabus and I review it with them, we kind of consult and make sure we're on the same page with that rubric and making sure that that rubric is directing them towards the course outcomes. Does that yes. answer the question? Yes. So each has their own individual syllabus. And uh, the, way we've, the way we try to set that up is to make sure they understand that doesn't mean you have to do three projects all by yourself. You can do one project on your own, but if there's two or three other people in the class who want to do a similar project, you can have a, another project that's two or three people. And you can have a third or a fourth project. And you can group or go single on any or none or all of those projects. And so it's, it's this really kind of fluid experience, which is, by my way of thinking about it, kind of how life is. You just kind of, sometimes you're doing your own projects, sometimes you're working with other people, and so we're trying to, in a way, model life for students. A follow-up? Yeah, part of what we try to do in the first few weeks of class is we kind of bump into each other and we have kind of meet and greet sessions or sometimes we've done like a speed dating, a scholarly peer speed dating thing. So they find out what each other is interested in, what they're doing, uh, and if there's any kind of cross interest across the room. And then they team up and sometimes their syllabus changes partway through the semester. And I'm okay with that because that's kind of how life is. Stuff changes. You get a new idea. You, you change a plan. Last semester I had a student who the beginning of the semester, she wanted to write an open letter to all people who have to respond to a griever, right? Someone who has lost somebody because she lost her husband and she was just appalled at the inability of most people to adequately respond to someone who is grieving. 
And she wanted to write an open letter to people about this. She started that project and got into it. She's like, I can't do this. This is too hard. I don't know how to do this. I said, you're welcome to change gears if you want. She changed gears and started working on a project about the high cost of textbooks. And then she got into that project. She's like, this is boring. I want to go back to the other project. And so she did, and she came back to the original project she started and finished out that project. Is there anything wrong with that? Absolutely not. That's how life is. Why wouldn't I set up a classroom to allow for that kind of exploration to happen? And, and it turned out great. It turned out just great. But that's all part of the process. We don't discount this project that she sort of started but didn't finish. We examine what she did do, what worked, what didn't work. We discuss it, and it's part of our overall assessment of the course. Yes, sir? Right. So the course outcomes were the same course outcomes that other faculty use for the same course. They're the standard department slash university outcomes, right? Those, those are the ones that I feel that that's what I'm being hired to teach. Uh, and so in the process of them writing their syllabus, developing their, their own curriculum, that's part of a conversation I have with each of them. And sometimes we have that conversation as a room. Sometimes I have that conversation one on one. How is what you've planned here? helping you achieve this course outcome. And if they're not quite getting there, then we say, okay, how can we rethink that? How can we focus that a little better to really get what we're trying to get to? And they're, I mean, these are smart kids, right? They're in college. They, they are able to look at an outcome and eventually, right? Not immediately, but eventually they can get there and say, oh yeah, this thing here I'm doing, this activity, this project, this paper, this research will help me get to that point. They, they can do that. They absolutely can. I think one of the things that, that I have been guilty of is looking at my students and forgetting that they are adults and treating them like kids. And I'm trying to re reset that and say, no, you are adults. You're full-fledged members of society. You can do everything legally that anybody else can do here, and illegally too if you wanted to. But right, I need to treat you that way, and hopefully, as I treat you with that kind of respect and uh, you have that kind of power and authority, that then you grow into it, right? Rather than trying to beat you down with a syllabus that has a thousand rules and that they can't ever keep track of all the little things that they're supposed to do, if, if that makes sense. Questions, Neil? So my classes are anywhere from 20 to 30 students, and I teach anywhere from three to five classes a semester. Uh, the, the, to me, this is no more time intensive than, any other form, than the other form of teaching that I was doing. I'm just spending my time in a different way. Rather than standing in front of a classroom and lecturing for 90, 75 minutes, I spend, maybe if they've invited me to, I will spend 10 or 15 minutes on a short lecture, but then I will also be a partner with them on a group project or an individual project, and I will, they will schedule time with me, right? They will treat me like a consultant, and they will schedule my class time. And we use the Canvas calendar to do that, and they go in and they pop and say, I want John for 10 minutes here, and I want John for 10 minutes, and they schedule out my time, right? They're in charge of my schedule for the class time. And if they want me to lecture, they put that in. If they want me to consult with this group or consult with this individual. And so they schedule my class time and, and the whole of class time, right? And often students are doing their own presentations in class. Either they're teaching concepts, taking the class through exercises or practices, or doing research presentations. 
And so they're all taking time in the class too, and so they schedule that out. Who wants to go when? What are we going to use John for? And so that's kind of how class time goes. Yeah, it's tricky. It's, in fact, it's really fascinating to watch that happen. It's kind of a social experiment, is watching them figure out what to do in this, because it's kind of a vacuum of authority for a, a little while. Because I'm saying, I'm not in charge, you're in charge, and the, but we, who's in charge? And then they don't know, and there will be one or two or three students who rise to fill that, that power vacuum, and they will start to lead out, and they will be the one to kind of give an example of what a research presentation looks like, or they'll say, what if we they will propose a structure. What if we had John do this? Or what if we use class time to do this? And somebody in the room, eventually, right? Because they know they've got to do something. Somebody eventually will step up and help the class organize. But it's, it's really fascinating to watch it happen. But, but I, I've had to learn to be really patient. Because one thing about this is it's not nearly as efficient as if I've got the plan, I know exactly what's going to happen, and I'm telling them exactly what to do and when. It's not nearly as efficient, but I think it's more real, and I think it's more meaningful, and I think that they will remember the experience far longer than if they're just doing what they're told. Yeah, pushback from students, it comes. It absolutely comes because in so some of the students don't want the responsibility. Right? As much as they may complain about sitting in lectures and taking notes off PowerPoints, part of them secretly wants to do only that. Right? And so I definitely get pushback from students. Uh, we start off the semester, uh, and I, uh, we, we examine a series of articles I've kind of collected over time about learning and what learning looks like and how it happens or doesn't happen. And so we kind of come up with a common framework for what does learning look like. And so that, I think, helps stave off a lot of the pushback because then they know they can't really argue that this is a better learning model than this one. Uh, so I think that helps. But periodically throughout the semester, they, there's still pushback. But what also helps is that not everybody gives pushback. And there are some students who just eat this up. And so that helps stave off pushback from the reluctant students as well because they see their peers thriving on it. And they, then that's a little peer pressure, a little positive peer pressure. So I think that helps too. Still, there is pushback. And uh, this past year, I'll be open and honest about it, my evaluation scores have dropped a little, right? Because there were students who were frustrated. But I, we, we repeat over and over, frustration precedes learning. There's no learning until you're frustrated and you are hungry for something. And so we always talk about that doesn't always satisfy them up front. So you just have to be ready for that. That's part of what happens. Hopefully, as I develop a little bit of scaffolding to help kind of take them more gently into this process, hopefully we'll kind of level back out on those evaluation scores, because you know, my department head will want to see that happen. <laughs> Karen? Yeah, that's, that's, a whole, that's a whole presentation right there, isn't it? Uh, a quick answer. If the frustration, if there's no outlet for that frustration, if there's no hope out of that frustration, then absolutely frustration can lead to abandonment. And probably for some students it does, right? And maybe that's why some of those scores are dropping. But one of the things that a typical syllabus doesn't often allow for is failure. If a student fails on one assignment in a typical syllabus, it can sink their grade for the whole semester. But where we're not setting up grades in that same way, failure or frustration doesn't necessarily lead to failure for the course. And so that's one of the advantages of using only a final grade, is that they know, oh, I've got time to regroup here and, and reset and figure out how to make this work. So I think that's part of it right there, is there has to be an avenue out of the frustration. Part of that avenue for, in my course, is let's sit down with John and work this out. And so I, I meet with them as absolutely often as they, will, they want to. 
uh, like I say, I'm reserving half of class time just for one-on-one -on -one consultations. And so once or twice a month, they can sit down with me. And of course, then there's office hours in addition to that. So to me, the one-on-one -on -one is the way to get through the frustration. Yes? Yeah, so that's a good question. And I haven't done the, uh, any careful analysis on this, but my gut feel on this as I've kind of looked at grades over the past year is that the grades tended toward uh, like a B plus average, B to A minus was kind of the territory before this. Now I'm getting more students who are hitting the A because of those, I've kind of unleashed them, right? And they've, they've gone. And I'm getting a few more students who are slipping. So the bell curve is flattening a little bit as I'm doing this, but I think roughly it's staying about the same. Um, probably B plus is the average grade that's coming out of my class. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Let's go for it. <laughs> Absolutely. I love E.E. E. Cummings. What's the point of capitalization? It's just extra work. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I've, I'm an editor too, so I, it's, it's a very deliberate decision. Yeah, go ahead. It's a good question. Uh, what we've been doing is the students and I assess it together. We've been meeting throughout the semester, so they actually already have a pretty good idea how they're doing in the course, right? Because, and each time we meet, we review what we talked about last time, we make goals for the future. So they already have a pretty good idea where they're at. I ask them to write me a letter saying, here's the grade I think I deserve and why. I come to them and we meet. We have a five minute consultation the last week of class. I come to them with, a, with the same thing. Here's the grade I think you deserve and why. We kind of lay it both on the table at the same time and compare notes and see where we're at and we negotiate until we're in agreement. It's worked out really well. Surprisingly, we are often, often very, very close. Often very close. Now, my department is the opposite. Uh, they're not regulated at all. Other than, as long as you're hitting your course outcomes, that's, that's kind of the bottom line. Uh, my department has been supportive of this. I have to give them due credit because they have been supportive. It's a risky thing. They were a little bit, uh, I'm not sure if this is a great idea, John, but they have been supportive. And so I give them due credit for that. Um, to me, uh, a, a teacher just has to have that latitude in a room if they're going to really be successful on, on effect, uh, effective teaching, effective learning in the classroom. Um, I don't know how to, yeah, I've never faced that kind of regulation from above, and so I don't have an answer for how to grapple with that. I think we're probably out of time, Neil. Thank you very much. <laughs>